Well, thank you so much for having me here. I am I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here, not only because it's really rainy and cold and wet uh, in Boston, and it's beautiful here, but also because I got to hear some really great talks in the last couple of days and have fun uh, at this Quiz Bowl. I wanted to mention Quiz Bowl because one thing that got revealed last night is I know absolutely nothing about television, um, which is kind of sad. Uh, and I, I really felt like I needed to, to make up for that. So I'm now um, letting you know that I know who these guys are. <laughs> these are Matt Stone and, yeah, him. And the <laughs> they're the writers for South Park. And uh, I actually have never seen South Park, but I've become interested in these guys um, because they apparently have a formula for storytelling, which they claim works for everything, screenplays, NIH grants, whatever you want. So we're now like trying to apply it to writing our NIH grants and seeing if that helps. Um, hopefully we won't be writing about anal probes, but... Um, <laughs> so their, their formula is you make a point, you say in the second paragraph you say but, and then say something else, and then you say therefore we're going to do such and such. So here's, the, here's our version of that, the usual TB narrative. You make the point, you know, TB is bad. We know TB is bad. Lots of people have it. Most of them are infected, but not diseased. And then we go on and say, that's good. Only a small percent of people who actually have TB, um, the infection will go on to get disease. And therefore, I'm going to do, you know, what, we have no idea why those people get TB. And therefore, we're going to go and do great experiments and ask for lots of money to do it. Voila. And since we're, we're talking about a screenplay, uh, we need the visuals here. So, you know, TB infection happens, but don't worry, or worry a little bit because TB disease is rare and, and we don't know what to do. But I don't think that story is actually true. Um, and that's one of the things I want to point out to you. So we've known for many, many years, and, and there's been just lots of really high quality research done in the pre-chemotherapeutic era on who actually gets TB. And we know a lot about who gets TB. This is Hans Reeder, who works for the IUA TLD. And you know you're really a public health person if you can say IUA TLD really fast. But it's the International Union Against TB and Lung Disease. And in, back in the 90s, uh, Hans Reeder summarized most of the risk factors that, for, that people had that caused TB. And it turns out, and he just did this by looking at the old literature very casually, uh, and here's his quite famous um, slide about the, the risk factors for each uh, uh, step in the progression to TB. And he's specifically talking about the risk for disease given that one has been infected here. Diabetes, he already mentioned. Uh, gastrectomy, silicosis, HIV. So over the last couple of decades, we've become much more rigorous around these kinds of reviews. And we and others have written uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, really trying to pinpoint what, how much these risk factors actually contribute to TB and how prevalent those risk factors are in the population. And this is an a, a exercise that involves estimating something called a population attributable risk, which basically says, if you have this risk factor, you, you, you know, if you didn't have that risk factor, you might have got disease anyway. And if you subtract that baseline level of disease from people, the population of people who have that risk factor, you get a population attributable risk. So if you take the sort of standard uh, risk factors, HIV, malnutrition, diabetes, alcohol, smoking, and indoor air pollution, you come up with a population attributable risk that's close to 100%. So we can say, OK, here are the people who get, get TB. It's not quite 100%, but it depends on what numbers you, you, know, you can play with, and you get slightly different numbers. One of the interesting things about this is that almost half of those, that burden, is due to metabolic risk factors, so diabetes and, and low BMI. So. <laughs> Is it really true that 100% that of TB is explained by, by all that? Pro probably not. It turns out that lots of people have more than one risk factor. And in fact, those risk factors cluster together in, in poverty. This is a paper we wrote a few years ago asking, why is it that the poor in India have a, have a much higher rate of TB than the wealthy? Well, there's, there's lots of reasons. But one is that those risk factors, tobacco, indoor air pollution, low BMI, et cetera, are concentrated in the poorest population. And so they're at, at much higher risk. You note the one that isn't, which is diabetes. Uh, so in India, diabetes tends to occur in, in higher uh, socioeconomic uh, 
um, uh, quintiles or quartiles, but that's not true everywhere. So this is a busy slide, and you only need to look at the little red boxes. That this is NHANES data on the rates of diabetes in people by wealth status and by ethnicity. So both, uh, if you look at the bottom uh, left, you'll see that the people in the lowest quintile have 17, a rate of 17.8% of them have diabetes, it's pretty high, compared to 8% in the highest uh, tertile. And similarly, uh, black and Mexican Americans have about 20% uh, are, are, uh, uh, diabetes compared to the much lower rate of about 10%. And so there are some actually interesting reasons for that, perhaps. Uh, there's some fascinating data that suggests that people born in famine years, so two mothers who presumably were affected by that famine, are at much higher risk for going on to, to type 2 diabetes later in life. This is data from Austria, uh, where there were a series of famines around the world wars. And if you look at the age of people, bo you know, people born in those years, their risk of uh, diabetes in later in life is, is much higher than, uh, in, than other people. And that data has been uh, reproduced in many countries, including uh, Biafra, China, um, and, and across the board. So I, I only deviate here on about diabetes because uh, it's something we're really interested in. I'm going to come back to it at the end. But basically, what I want to say from this is that we know that host metabolism and nutrition affect TB risk. But we also know that TB disease affects host metabolism. And we've heard a lot about that in the last couple of days, about how MTB actually manipulates host cells. And in, uh, here's some data suggested also uh, manipulates the host in a systemic way by uh, ha causing hyperglycemia that is then reduced during treatment. And so it's kind of difficult to disentangle which is cause and which is effect. And that is a real problem for epidemiologists because we actually can't do experiments in people other than clinical trials. And so we have to try to figure out when we see things that co-occur, which are causing, what's the cause and what's the effect. So is, is low, poor, mal, poor, poor nutrition the cause of TB, or is it the effect of TB? We know that TB causes cachexia. We know that people who are cachexic get TB. So the way we deal with that is by doing something called a cohort study. And a cohort study, is, I'm sure you know, means enrolling a, a big population and following them over a long period of time. And what's really important about this is that when you start that study, you need to make sure that the people in the study don't already have the disease. So that's tricky. Uh, because we don't always know whether people have TB or not. And I, I know that Cliff's going to tell us more about this uh, in, in a little bit. But we need to, to enroll people who are at high risk for developing a disease, follow them for a fairly long time, assess their baseline exposures, and then see what happens to them at the end. And so we start, wanted to do this for a whole series of both host and bacterial risk factors associated with progression to disease, and, and risk factors that in, involved health services and, um, and, and the environment. So we did this in Peru, in Lima, where we have been working for many years. This is the uh, general environment. We work in the shanty towns outside of the city. It's an enormous city. Um, health status in Peru is, it's a middle income country, uh, but uh, still is afflicted by, by serious poverty and TB rates within these areas of the shanty towns are actually pretty high. And this was part of a complex study that involved uh, following households, enrolling households of people uh, exposed to indexed patients with TB, measuring their infection and their disease at baseline, following them over time, and then collecting lots of things and sending them out to lots of different people. So it was a big, complicated uh, effort um, involving a, a lot of our colleagues. You see Branch Moody up here and Sarah Fortune, who are doing some of the work on, um, on the bacteria. So here's the basics of it. We enrolled index patients. At, uh, at baseline, we collected their uh, TB isolates. We drew blood. We um, and stored it. We collected data on all their sociodemographics. And then we followed them for two years, um, to, w walking with them through treatment, f measuring treatment outcomes, and eventually looking at relapse. And then at the time those index patients were enrolled, we went to their households and invited their households to, uh, to enroll in the study. And then so we enrolled people who were at high, had been exposed to TB and were at high risk, measuring their infection status and disease status at baseline, 
uh, anthropometrics, ruling out TB disease, or trying to rule out TB disease, uh, and, and collecting um, blood samples for later, uh, for later storage. So really briefly, index patients got, were collected um, from 106 different clinics where we were uh, monitoring uh, the disease so that we could pick up index patients and assess for all these things. And then um, most of our households were visited in the field uh, and we collected all these data. So here's just, just to give you a sense of what it's like to do field work. Uh, this is quite different from, from the fundamental research that goes on in the lab. But here are um, some of our huge team. We have a BSL-3 uh, that does cl uh, clinical laboratory work. And uh, because this was, ended up being a huge study, we ended up having something like over 300 people working on this study at one time. So it was a, a massive, um, a massive effort on the part of our incredible team in Lima. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure if you can see this all that well, we collected data on 4,500 index patients and 14,000 household contacts. About half of those household contacts were infected at baseline when we went into the household. Uh, and the other half, a little bit less than half, uh, of the other half, about half of them became infected over the, the year we followed them. So we followed household contacts for a year. And um, in the end, we had about 660 uh, incident TB cases among the household contacts after ruling out people who had active TB at baseline. And we were relieved to find that um, all of the risk factors that we know are associated with TB progression were picked up. Um, the, the top, what, we were actually doing this study to look at the impact of drug resistance on transmission. And as we expected, we found there was no uh, difference in the likelihood that people would develop active TB disease depending on their drug resistance profile. Uh, but HIV, diabetes, um, BCG vaccination, nutritional status, receiving isoniazid preventive therapy, all did pretty much what we expected to do in the same magnitude that, we, that people had seen in the past. So we went on to ask some questions around metabolism. And one of the things that has been interesting uh, is that people are protected from TB as their BMI goes up. And that is true even at very high BMIs. So unlike many infectious diseases where there's sort of a U-shape or a J-shape curve of high risk with low BMI and then high risk uh, with high BMI, what we've seen in the past with TB is that the, the, the more obese one gets, the more protected one is. And um, most of those studies have not included people with really high BMIs. So because our population did have some, some people with high BMIs, we looked again at that data and found that, in fact, uh, it's true that if you protect that people with BMIs over 35, so morbidly obese, are protected from TB after an exposure. But that is not true in children. So we did have obese children. Um, and we really think that uh, childhood TB and kids, people under age 12 is a, is a completely different entity and perhaps not as influenced by some of these metabolic factors. Uh, and they were not at, higher, uh, at, at, at reduced risk. So then we went, went on to, to ask some questions about nutritional status. Um, and we had to do this in something called a nested case control design. So we didn't have the resources to measure uh, some of the things we wanted to measure in all 14,000 people, um, and we didn't really need to. So we uh, collected, we identified who, who became cases. We age and gender matched them to people who didn't become cases and went back and pulled their blood and looked at, at what had happened at baseline. Uh, and we were particularly interested in vitamin D for obvious reasons. You know, we were, at the time we did this, we were convinced that we would see that vitamin D would be a very strong risk factor for developing, D deficiency would be a strong risk factor. So you're all familiar with the fact that um, vitamin D is, uh, uh, has been used to treat TB for, for decades or centuries. This is um, heliotherapy that people would get in Europe to uh, treat their TB. Cod liver oil is a standard and uh, approach to treating TB before in the pre-chemotherapeutic -chemo era. And in fact, there's some evidence that it was, it was actually successful. And then Niels Finson received the Nobel Prize uh, for showing that light therapy would treat lupus vulgaris, which is a, a um, now very rare form of skin TB. 
But when we went back and looked at baseline vitamin D levels in people who went on to develop TB, we found that there was a small but, but insigni statistically insignificant uh, impact of low uh, vitamin D on TB risk. So you see the vitamin D deficient levels uh, in the bottom and then by quartile up the, in the top. And it turns out that um, there's some effect, but, but not much, certainly not what we were expecting. And we were quite disappointed. But interestingly, if you look at the other, the, there's been very few other prospective studies that have followed people over long periods of time. But one of them is, is one that was done in Pakistan, a uh, small study. But in that study, everyone who went on to develop TB had been vitamin D deficient. And in fact, what was different about that study than ours was that people were extremely vitamin D deficient. So even their people in their top uh, levels of vitamin D would have fallen into the category that we would have considered vitamin D deficient by the, the sort of technical definitions. So our, our kind of take on this is our population wasn't particularly vitamin D deficient. They, they, um, there was a lot of uh, vitamin D deficiency that met criteria but for deficiency, but the levels were not particularly low. Lima's on the equator. Um, it's, it's, it is cold and rainy in the winter, but they do, people do get a fair amount of uh, sunshine exposure all year round. But then we went on to look at other things. And actually, this was kind of a throwaway. We, we had the blood. We were, we were testing it. The, the lab said, oh, do you want us to do other stuff? And we said, sure, why don't you do a whole series of other things? And so we were quite stunned when um, our vitamin A levels, our retinol levels, came back as very strongly predictive of TB risk. And so just to put this in context, people who are vitamin A deficient were over 10 times more likely to go on to develop uh, TB. And, and most importantly, even within quartiles, that are, of, of all these other quartiles are considered vitamin A replete, uh, but at every level underneath the top uh, quartile, people were at increased risk. Um, and those risks were between three and five as you went down by quartiles. And then we wanted to look at children or adolescents because we think that adolescents are the people who are most likely to progress from, their, from a infection caused by the exposure to the index case, whereas older people might be reactivating their TB. And we found in the adolescent group, they were even more strongly, uh, the, the vitamin A deficiency was even more strongly associated with a risk factor of almost 20. So we were just, you know, we, we, we couldn't believe this. And we said, OK, so what could be wrong here? And one of the things that could be wrong is that people actually might have had active TB at the time that, at baseline, and that we might have missed it. We did a pretty thorough job to look for, for um, active TB. But as we all know, TB is an insidious disease that can, can slowly progress. And we also know that generalized inflammation, so elevated um, C-reactive protein, is associated with low vitamin A levels. So we tried to approach that in two different ways. We, we looked at the people who were skin test negative at, at baseline, but went on to develop active disease. And in them, uh, we still found the same trend. Uh, with the quartiles, it's the same numbers. The actual vitamin A deficiency levels uh, kind of fluctuate all over the place because the numbers are so small. But um, we really saw exactly the same thing. And then we looked at people who didn't progress until at least three months uh, after they had been enrolled. And again, saw, saw very similar results. And we're gratified to see a recent paper, actually not yet published uh, in print, but um, available online. Uh, that show that followed a cohort of HIV-infected patients at high risk for TB, measured baseline vitamin A and vitamin D, and found very similar results. Their vitamin D results are, are significant, uh, but their vitamin A results are even more strongly significant and uh, higher. But, but an interesting fact, which was something we saw in our data, is that people, if, if you see this, these dotted lines, people tended to get who were, were deficient tended to get disease in the short term. So that might reflect the fact that these levels change over time. Or again, it might reflect the fact that people have undiagnosed TB uh, at the time of, that they're assessed. So I knew nothing about uh, vitamin A, but most of you who were here yesterday do because Elliot Kim gave a great talk about vitamin A work he's doing in his lab and, and um, updated everybody on vitamin A. But um, what I do know is that vitamin A deficiency is extremely common, especially in children, throughout the world, with about 
of the world's children in low and middle income countries being affected. We actually don't know what the, what the percent is in adults because people don't really follow uh, people other than pregnant women. So, we, so the, the, there's almost no data on the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency in adults. Vitamin A is something you get from the diet. There, you, there's absolutely, you absolutely need it. Um, and there's two main sources, meat, dairy, liver, fish, and then uh, orange-colored vegetables. But, but the uh, meat and fish and milk access is, is much more bioaccessible. So what does it do? Uh, we heard yesterday a, a little bit about how it's tr about the basic biology taken up through um, food, stored in the liver, transported to target cells by something called retinal binding protein, and then metabolized uh, in certain cells to uh, all transretinoic acids, which is the active form of, the, of, of, of um, vitamin A. And there, uh, it serves as a ligand to a, a, a um, vitamin A, a, a retinoid receptor, which alters the expression of a vast number of genes and does all sorts of things that have to do with metabolism and immunity. So super complex and hard to get your head around. I've been struggling with it for the last year or so. But, uh, and we did hear yesterday about some really interesting things that it does in macrophages. Um, but it also does some things to systemic immunity. So uh, there's been a number of really interesting reviews in the last couple of years on the role of retinol in um, differentiating dendritic cells and uh, their impact on T cell responses. And the, the, the really, the, the literature is so vast that I can't summarize it except to say that it looks like it has two different effects. One at homeostasis, where, it, where uh, ATRA has a tolerogenic effect on T cells. Um, turning on Tregs and turning off uh, inflammatory responses. But during infection and inflammation, uh, it has a, uh, a more active um, role in inflammatory responses. So one of the interesting things for us was this association with diabetes. And there have been a series of really nice papers by a, a group um, led by Laszlo Nagy, who has looked at uh, the regulation of, of, uh, of ATRA and it's shown that PPAR gamma controls both retinol, uh, uh, a conversion of retinol to all transretinoic acid, and then through that CD1D. And so here's a, a, you know, a series of, of um, uh, experiments they did, which basically comes up with this pathway. So PPAR gamma is regulated by uh, lipids. It is, um, one can agonize it through rosaglitazone use. Um, that turns on this RALDH2, which converts retinol to ATRA. ATRA then turns on all these genes, but among them CD1D, and eventually uh, invariant natural killer cell uh, activation. Okay, so that idea, uh, that that's all sort of a, a good thing that maybe um, uh, ATRA does for TB protection is very different from some of the data that's produ been produced by Larry Schlesinger when he's looked at PPAR gamma agonism in macrophages. So what he has shown is that if you turn on PPAR gamma, uh, you get increased uh, mycobacterial growth, the, the um, development of foam cells, and that, that blocking that will reverse that. But again, yesterday we heard some very interesting um, um, data about the fact that macrophages don't actually make RALDH2, uh, so they don't turn retinol into ATRA. And um, it's possible that that's a very different model from the one that we see in, in vivo. And in fact, we have colleagues um, at the, in Colorado who are working with, with us on a, another um, sort of iteration of this uh, study on, with a guinea pig model. And what they've done is treated infected guinea pigs with infected TB, uh, guinea pigs with TB, and then treated them with a series of anti- or, or hypoglycemic drugs, among them rosaglitazone. So here's their data on rosaglitazone-treated uh, guinea pigs with TB. They're less pathology, um, lower CFUs, but not significant at 90 days, uh, and lower pathology, histopathology, which is significant. So you might argue, but that's just sugars, right? That if you treat them with rosaglitazone, they're going to lower their sugars, and we know that sugars, high sugars are associated with bad TB outcomes. 
But in fact, at the doses of rosiglitazone that the guinea pigs were getting, there was no difference in the oral glucose tolerance test uh, in mock uh, untreated and rosiglitazone treated guinea pigs. So I just have to add, a, that's my two cents about guinea pigs. Um, it turns out uh, serendipitously that they actually evolved in, in Peru, in the Andes, uh, where they are a, both uh, very much appreciated in, in local um, festivals, but also eaten. Um, and I, I love this uh, Last Supper um, uh, painting in a church in Lima, where the, the meal is actually a nice, plump guinea pig. So I, I'm convinced that what makes, I've, I've never tried guinea pig, I just can't bring myself to, but I'm convinced what makes it good is that it's really fatty. And uh, interestingly, it, it's the one small animal model that has lipid profiles very similar to those in human beings. So we think it's actually quite a good model for this uh, work on diabetes. And um, we've now uh, convinced one of, the, one of our collaborators, um, Brendan Podell, to develop a vitamin A deficiency model in, in guinea pigs, and he's beginning that work now. So um, I want to switch gears a little bit and tell you uh, uh, another aspect of what we've been doing with our, some of our blood samples. So we, we wanted to address this question of, of metabolic risk factors for TB progression and, and to get around this causality problem. Um, and one way to do that is through something called Mendelian randomization. So if you know that there's a series of genes associated with a series of metabolic uh, states, and you go and say, well, but, but you were assigned those genes at birth, so they can't be caused by TB infection or TB disease, then we can ask the question, are those, are, are those genetic factors associated with TB? And, and that's called Mendelian randomization. So we've... we've um, been gone back uh, to our blood samples, pulled them, um, and we are specifically looking at the qu question of what are the genetic risk factors associated with progression to active disease among people who probably have primary TB. Um, and I'll give you, show you in a moment how we, how we decided whether they had primary disease. So this has been challenging because there's very, very little known about genetics uh, of, of people in Peru. And that is because um, in, you know, very little uh, work has been done on Native American populations. South America has been hugely neglected in terms of the uh, Human Genome Project, et cetera. And um, there are no tools. And so our team, uh, this is Shomo Ray Chaudhuri, who's a geneticist and uh, T-cell immunologist at, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, who mostly works in rheumatology, but we've convinced him to become interested in TB, and his postdoc, um, Yang Luo. And uh, we had, they helped us design a, a um, through an exome sequencing project, design a tool of an exome chip that was specific to the Lima population, looking at alleles that came up in the in a subset of our patients that had exome sequencing, and then focused on genes and variants that we knew were associated with either immune deficits, TB risk in other populations, or metabolic factors like BMI, adiponectin, and, and type 2 diabetes. So we developed this customized array. Uh, a, a, a ton of work went into that in using both our, our exomes, uh, our exome sequences, our whole exome sequences, uh, reviewing the literature and then looking at the uh, available public data sets. And then we went back to our blood samples. And if you remember, we collected these, these samples uh, and stored blood. And we specifically went in and looked for people who had TB that was either uh, clustered, so in, in uh, molecular, where groups of people shared molecular fingerprints, because we assumed that's a proxy for recent transmission. And people who develop TB uh, after recent transmission are more likely to have primary disease and reactivation disease. And then we um, sampled uh, the controls, people who did not, who were exposed, but did not develop active TB. We followed them up, this was just done this past year, so we followed them up uh, to find out that they were still not uh, TB diseased two years later, two to five years later. And we looked at 1,500 cases and 1,500 matched controls. And here's uh, our first um, look at our data. Uh, we were quite um, pleased to see that there are a number of uh, highly significant uh, um, hits, including some at the 
uh, at the cutoff for um, after uh, uh, bond for any correction um, for sort of the magic numbers of uh, you know ten to the minus five hundred times ten to the minus eighth. Um, and we are now going back and drilling down on what specific genes these are and uh, through sequencing those sites um, and looking at uh, HLA. The, uh, Shomo and Yang have developed a method to infer HLA from, whole gene, from, from exome chips data. And uh, that's, we're working on that now. So we also wanted to use this uh, data do something called LD score regression. So the idea of LD score regression is that, you know, you often see linkage uh, disequilibrium, and so when if there is a gene that's associated with an outcome, it can be associated with all sorts of other genes that aren't associated with an outcome, just because it's in proximity, and that that proximity stays within populations. But if you look across populations, you shouldn't see that. You should that that, that should be very specific to a particular population. So one can ask the question. How heritable is a particular trait by comparing uh, the LD, uh, the, the linkage equilibrium across different populations? And so we asked the question if you do this kind of selection of primary TB cases as opposed to what most GWASs have done in the past on TB, which is take all TB cases, do, you, do we get more heritability? And in fact, we do. So uh, the primary TB group here is our data from Lima, which shows that uh, the, the heritability is about 30%, compared to data from Russia and a couple of other GWASs that you know, just collected TB cases and did not separate primary from reactivation t TB, where it's, it's quite a bit less heritable. So you can also use LD um, score regression to ask the question, are different traits correlated? Are di and, and this is a, just an example of a, a map of genetic correlations across human diseases using this technique to say, to take these public databases and say, which of these genetic traits that have a whole series of, of, of polygenic uh, markers associated with them are, are actually correlated? Uh, and so we are doing that now with some of our metabolic diseases, looking at whether the known genes associated with um, uh, or, or the genes that we find in big data sets associated with metabolic traits and immune um, traits are correlated with TB. So uh, this work has been done by um, a huge number of people. Uh, our, we have a, a big TB team in Boston. Um, I want to point out Mercedes Bracera, who was my uh, co, the co-lead of our Lima work. Um, we have a vast team in Lima that I can't, I can't even begin to name everybody, but they've been extraordinary. Um, we've, our funding has recently switched to, be, to the TB Research Unit group that is funded out of NIH, and uh, Branch Moody is my co-PI in that. We've, as I said, we've managed to um, bring in Shomo Ray Chowdhury and his postdocs, who've just been extraordinarily helpful in uh, the genetic work. And the Colorado TBRU team uh, doing the guinea pig work is Randy Bessaraba and, and Brendan Podell. So um, I'm going to stop there and take questions. As long as it's not about South Park. <laughs> <laughs> or Quinton. Um, I, I was wondering if you could uh, expand a little bit on why you think that this obesity issue, you know, it causes protection in general, but then also why would that be different in, in kids versus adults? Is there any way to, to think about that? So I think it's really strange that it causes protection. I mean, you know, when you think about uh, these really high BMIs, you know, I, I'm assuming, uh, though I have actually no data to support it, that there is a metaflammation, you know, phenotype where people, um, and that that metaflammation uh, phenotype is actually protective against TB. Um, and it, you know, I, if you want to get really speculative, you could imagine that one of the reasons we have these bad diseases like atherosclerosis is that we evolved to, uh, to, to protect ourselves against TB. And now you know, we, that when, when the body recognizes lipids as you know, foreign, it turns on atherosclerosis. So why not in kids? I mean, kid, childhood TB is a completely different entity. Um, 
and we don't really understand it very well. But uh, kids between, you know, at, at, from birth to age four are super high risk for TB progression. Um, then their risk drops to almost uh, flat, and then it, uh, TB risk then picks up around adolescence. Um, so we see this in adolescents, but not in this younger age group. And um, you know, I wish I understood childhood TB, but I, I really, really don't. I, I think there's only so much of an immune response that kids can um, mount, especially if, if you're thinking about things like, okay, so now we're getting really, really uh, speculative. I imagine that um, there are physical constraints around, like say, uh, nodes in the, around the trachea that would actually make it uh, hard for kids to mount the kind of immune response that and, and survive that, that adults can, can mount. So they have completely different uh, protection mechanisms. Um, and I, they don't seem to be associated but, uh, with, with these metabolic traits. But why, I don't know. So the answer is no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is how do you think about it? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so um, there's old studies from the 80s and 90s that looked at vitamin A community supplementation and sort of randomized trial style and showed decreases in mortality for children, things like that. Did any of those studies look at TB as a specific endpoint? And what, I guess what's known in the prior epidemiology literature with vitamin A deficiency right. in TB? So we looked really carefully. Um, it, I mean, so childhood TB is really hard to diagnose uh, because you don't get microbiological evidence of TB. And so now we have algorithms and we call it or don't call it. But it means that while there were a, a whole bunch of really um, nice and big uh, clinical trials of vitamin A supplementation in children, so children routinely get supplemented in most middle-income and low-income countries at birth. And that's uh, assumed to prevent night blindness, which it does, um, which is a very, very common uh, uh, problem before vitamin A supplementation, but also to reduce mortality from diarrhea and measles. And that data is reasonable, um, although it's been, uh, there was a trial in India a, uh, a few years ago which showed that it didn't have, the vitamin A supplementation did not have a big impact on mortality. There is nothing on TB that I can find in that literature in TB in kids. And I'm assuming it's because um, it's really hard to know whether the kids had TB or not. Uh, one of the, so, so there have been a couple of other um, perspective studies besides the one I just showed you. One was done in the 1940s in the US in Philadelphia in a, a cohort of African American men uh, who were followed for seven years um, and who had, uh, had blood drawn at baseline. You know, hard to know in 1947 how retinol was measured, but they did find a, uh, an association of, with an odds ratio of about four. Um, and interestingly, people's retinols were so low that uh, it was sort of like the opposite of what we found, that the, the control group would have been what we would consider low. So I think that their odds ratio of four is actually an underestimate because they were comparing low to very low. Uh, and that's, that's really it, other than this um, most recent uh, study in HIV. So Megan, um, it, I think it's terrific you're doing these studies. They're very difficult, as, as you pointed out. Um, nutritional studies are, the uh, vitamin A levels are entangled with other nu micronutrients and all, and um, obesity is connected to socioeconomic status uh, to some extent, both positively and negatively, depending on which um, demographic you're looking at. Um, so do you think that there is more than one thing underneath this. I mean, for example, is, does vitamin A correlate with other nutrients which are also making contributions to uh, uh, susceptibility? Yeah, sure. I mean, w one of the things we did in this study was we controlled for the other nutrients that we measured. So that's vitamin D, and we controlled for BMI. So, you know, w one could argue that a lot of the, um, the people who had low BMI or even low D were also vitamin A deficient, but nobody measured it. Um, of course, there's an infinite number of nutrients that we could measure, so it, you know, it might be something else. And that's why I think we need to go to these um, lab models. So it turns out there, there was a fair amount of interest in this in the her pre-chemotherapeutic era. And there were a number of animal studies uh, that did show an association between vitamin A deficiency and, and TB risk, but it's incredibly hard to keep animals alive uh, on a vitamin, low vitamin A diet. So um, that's been the problem up till now. And we'll, 
you know, we do have the ability to block um, RADL, ALDH2 now. And so if, if we can't keep our guinea pigs alive uh, on a low diet, we can try other ways of looking at this question. But I, I think it's going to require an, uh, a, a, an animal model. Oh, uh, hi, I have a quick, slightly unfair question and then a comment. So the question is, I'm dying to know what your hit on chromosome three is that's <laughs> you know, way 500 times 10 to the minus eight. So I, I have been sworn that until the actual um, sequencing around that, that loci has been completed, that I, I, I my figured, lips yeah, are sealed. I figured that would <laughs> if be If it were my data, I'd tell you, but you know, it's, uh, there's, there's, they just want to be 100% sure before we. Yeah. Come up with that. So then, then the comment is about the BMI over 35 being protective, and I, I think that's so fascinating, and I, I, I can think of four things offhand that might um, uh, underlie that. So, so one is the vitamin A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble vitamins, so maybe the total body amount of vitamin A and D is super high, and, and that's part of it. Um, the second is whether uh, host lipids or oxidized host lipids have direct antimicrobial properties and are actually acting to kill... TB. Um, the third is um, whether there's, you know, there's obviously microbiome alterations um, associated with obesity and whether small molecules produced by the microbiome are antimicrobial. Um, and then the fourth one, oh, is as you said, the total body adipokines and NK T cell activation and all these things, whether those are actually antimicrobial. So I, I think it's fascinating and well worth really um, honing in on the biology. Yeah, well, there's a nexus of, of stuff going on around, so, and it's really complex. So uh, around um, you know, lipids, the association between uh, LDL and um, PPAR gamma activation, and then the downstream effects of that. Uh, and, and there's a, a lot of really fascinating work on the microbiome and how um, retinal metabolism really depends on what the microbiome is, and that uh, the idea that the microbiome seems to um, instruct dendritic cells is, is something that a, a lot of groups have, have been, been working on. And I think what we'd love to do is do a vitamin A trial in people at high risk and also look at microbiomes uh, in those people receiving supplements. So, so there's data from Bangladesh that shows that um, in men who were shown to be vitamin A deficient, that repleting them uh, did improve their levels. There's always been a concern with vitamin D that even like, giving people vitamin D supplements does not necessarily bring up their levels uh, as much as one would hope. But vitamin A supplementation does bring up adults' levels. And then one sees uh, a whole range of T cell functions that have been altered, including uh, CD1, the, the, you know, the uh, activation through CD1D. Next quick question. Hi, you, you mentioned that uh, vitamin A can cause different systemic effects, uh, especially with T cell subsets. Have you looked in, in the blood samples to see uh, in these vitamin A deficient people are the subsets, or in the sufficient people, is there a difference in these T cell subsets, at least in the frequency? We hadn't because we drew these you know, blood and stored it, but we are currently repeating um, a small version of the same study design, but in a much smaller number. And uh, in that study design, we're, we're um, obtaining a PBMCs and, and uh, you know, doing this in real time. And we will look at uh, people, we'll, we'll measure vitamin A and then repeat uh, the, the, the measures of T cells in people who get supplemented for um, vitamin A deficiency. So that's, that I think will also be really helpful. Thank you, Megan. Yeah.